Do you want to feel happier? Do you want to feel more radiant and more alive? To go beyond alive and to feel truly like you are thriving? That's what I'm here for. Helping you find that best you that you know is in there. It is. And you can start accessing that you today. It's possible. If you're ready for a shortcut to just that, let's work together. Reach out and let's work one-on-one -on -one to transform you and your life into happy, into thriving. Reach out to me and book a quick call. It's in the show notes and let's get you there. Are you really committed and ready? Let's do it. I'm the happiest I've ever been thanks to all the practices I've made a part of my life. You can be too. It's here for you. You can also access my course, The Youthfulness Hack, which is all about feeling good and getting radiant and all the things I do concentrated in one spot. Go there today and use code AMY15 for 15% off right now, only for listeners of this show. And if you are ready to truly have accountability and live happy, book a call with me today. The world needs your best. Commit and show up. Let's do this. Hello and welcome to the Amy Edwards Show. I'm your host, Amy Edwards, and we are here to transform our lives, become our next best version in the most efficient way possible. I am so happy that you're here. Thank you so much for joining us today because we're talking about communication and voice, which is so dear to my heart. If you listen to this show, you know that that is like big time my thing. Now, one of the things that I usually talk about is our voice and how we communicate with ourselves. And today we're gonna talk to an expert on communicating with others and the frequencies of communication. So welcome, Erwin McManus. I am so excited that you're here. Erwin, you are an entrepreneur, a communicator, a futurist, a thought leader, and an author whose books have sold more than a million copies worldwide. You're also the founder of the Mosaic Movement, which is based in Hollywood, and the creator of the courses, The Art of Communication, and The Seven Frequencies of Communication, which you, I got to hear you speak on this not long ago, and that's why I reached out to have you on the show because it it just spoke spoke to me, no pun intended, so so <laughs> much um, because this is so foundational for us as humans and to live our best life. We cannot do it without communicating in the most effective way possible, and for me, in the most honest way possible. And I just I love that when I asked my intake questions and it was like what do you say your messages in one sentence you wrote that your singular intention is to violate our view of reality and that's <laughs> that's incredible i would love for you to speak to that a little bit just to kick us off um today so welcome and thank you for coming amy it's so good to be with you yeah, I don't think I'm going to be as smooth and eloquent as you are. And uh, you <laughs> clearly have 30 years of practice. On this. <laughs> I think you uh, have plenty of years under your belt as an effective communicator. I have no doubt about that. So, in fact, you know, I was curious how. So this, let me just go ahead and just debrief everyone. Or maybe you can debrief just on the seven frequencies real quick. So people can get a feel for where we're coming from with what we're talking about. Yeah. Well, what's interesting for me is that I, I've been on this communication journey, you know, for really all of my adult life. Um, I ended up having a career as a communicator. And um, over the past 40 years, I've spoken to millions of people live across the world in arenas up to over 100,000 people. And, 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 you know, so it's, it's, been, it's been my life. And, uh, but it didn't begin in arenas at 40, 50,000 or 80, 90,000. It began with just a handful of people learning how to speak talk to people one-on-one -on -one and learning how to connect to people on a, a deeply personal and human level. But I, I grew up incredibly introverted and reclusive and shy, and I never talked. And in fact, wow. um, yeah, I had an <laughs> uncle who saw me in college and he said, so do you talk now? He didn't mean for a living. He meant just uh, as a, as a functional <laughs> practice. And, and he said, I, I drove you all the way to um, Chapel Hill where I went to college. It was about a 15 hour drive. And I never said a word. And so I, I was a guy that could live in my inner world and, and, and never really extrovert myself at all. But what really happened for me was I, I had a, a life-changing personal faith experience. And then I felt like I had something to share for the first time that I thought really mattered. And, and so a huge part of communication for me is um, just helping people be able to 
effectively express what's really inside of them and connecting to people at a deep, visceral, uh, transcendent level. Um, you know, it, the word communication has the same etymology as the word community and the same mm -hmm. etymology as the word commune. And, you know, so when you're thinking about communication, it's not just about a, a public skill. I mean, communication is really the art of connecting to people. It's, it's the art of creating community and the art of creating communion with other human beings. And you know, as well as I do in any kind of relationship, I've been married almost 40 years. And so I've, I've, um, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in it for the long haul. <laughs> and communication is essential and critical to our marriage. And, and realizing that my wife and I are so dramatically different. You know, I, I'm an immigrant from El Salvador. My, my wife is a, a, a mountain girl, an Irish girl from the mountains of North Carolina. And, uh, and so we have completely different backgrounds. And, and, and our communication journey was quite a challenging one. She comes from a very verbal, very expressive, very um, outgoing, extroverted family. And when, when we would fight, uh, I knew Kim was mad. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and then when I would um, express myself, it was always more subtle, a little more um, controlled. And, and I remember even a couple of years into our marriage, I would say to her, honey, I, I don't know what I need to do to convince you that these things really bother me. And she goes, but you don't yell and you don't <laughs> scream and you don't seem mad. So I don't take it seriously because you seem so calm. And so I tell her, look, when I say something calmly, that's the same thing as you yelling <laughs> and, uh, at me. And, it, and so I began realizing that we were not even communicating on the same frequencies. But do you think that you two kind of were attracted to each other to seek that balance, maybe? Like there was something within you seeking that? Because it's interesting that she was attracted too to somebody that never spoke for however many years. Well, I think when you're younger, you're attracted to opposites. And when you're older, you're attracted to similarities. Mm. And so when people are married when they're older, they're usually marrying someone that's very similar to them mm. because they don't, they're, they're less willing to let their natural life patterns be disrupted by another human being. That's but when interesting. You're, when you're 18 or 19 or 20, you want to be completely disrupted. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's the volatility that actually excites you. Yeah. And, uh, and, Good point. Uh, and, yeah. And, and, and draws you in. So it mm -hmm. just depends on where, and that's why, honestly, that's why sometimes marriages have a hard time making it because if you're married young and you marry someone who's very volatile in a relationship to you, there's a lot of dynamic. And then, you start getting older and you want someone who doesn't disrupt your traffic patterns that are your psychological uh, migration and who you are as a person. And you have to figure out how to navigate that, how to negotiate it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, that's a side note. Yeah. And yeah. So I I've been studying human communication, you know, for at least 45 years and you have a, 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 a psychology background and, and, and really more in the social anthropology and, and, and I just began noticing that, that sometimes you hear someone communicate and it doesn't resonate, even though it's true. And, and then sometimes someone says something that isn't true, but it actually resonates with you. And I'm going, wait a minute, it, it isn't always about the data. It's about the frequency in which is from which it's communicated. And it's also what began to strike me was that when you listen to speakers and there are speakers who are quoting the same making the same statements that someone else does. They're using cliches or using common phrases, but it doesn't come across the same way as the person who initially said it. Because the person who initially said it was actually saying it from their core, from their essence, from who they really are. And then the person who was um, capturing that statement and then using it in their presentation, was it was something that was coming from the outside, not from the inside. Something that they had, they had um, adopted, but not something that actually had integrated and so I really want to help people learn how to communicate at the most authentic, transparent, and organic and powerful way possible. So I took 40 years of learning, put together the art of communication, help people understand what, what are the intrinsic motivations from which people um, um, receive and live. Um, because it, if you look at a great, every great film has certain narratives all the way through it. And, and so in the art of communication, I talk about these hu three human intrinsics. Um, the, the human need for progress, the human need uh, for meaning, and the human need for intimacy. And, uh, and, and every great movie has all three. Mm -hmm. Bad movies have only one, 
And good movies have two. So you have like, you know, maybe it's like the Fast and Furious and, you know, right. And you're going very few people maybe like that or but some people do because it's it's a movie. It's really about action. It's about progress. It's about heroes. It's about people who could accomplish things. But it's also about intimacy because it's about this band of brothers and sisters who do life together and closer than blood. And so you realize, oh, no, it's not just about uh, progress and achievement. It's also about intimacy and community and relationship. And then, and then they are able to slip in this, uh, there's always something has to be solved that gives them a sense of meaning. It's what makes their life important. It's what makes their life uh, matter. So even a movie as simple as The Fast and Furious carries these three intrinsics. <laughs> Sometimes a movie skews in a direction like Sense and Sensibilities or Pride and Prejudice. Those would be a core theme of, of the human need for intimacy. And, and then the other um, intrinsics are secondary. And that's why those movies draw a certain kind of person, a person where that's the, the intrinsic that's driving them. So part of what I try to do in, 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 a, in a, a section of this course is help people understand human intrinsics, what motivates people, what drives them, what compels them, what cravings are there, and how to tell a great story and tying in those human intrinsics. And then there's a whole other aspect, um, which I didn't share with you at the conference that we were together in Salt Lake, but... I, I didn't talk about how there, there are five elements to the communicator. And I try to help a person understand themselves almost as a vehicle of communication. And because all of um, human existence is about frequencies. Yeah, mm -hmm. Everything is really about these incredible vibrations that uh, connect us all together. And if we can understand ourselves as a vehicle that is transmitting a, a beautiful truth, that if it's translated properly, will change someone's life. Mm -hmm. A communication becomes a, uh, an art form. It's a gift. It it becomes a power that brings change for the good. And, yes. And, you know, and, and so we kind of walk through that process. I use five elements of earth, wind, fire, water, and wood to help a person begin to understand the universe of, of who they are as a communicator. And some people are more one than others. Um, my, my wife would be more fire. You know, and uh, and her core when she speaks is her passion. You know, um, maybe I might be more wind. I um, um I I'm a person who moves toward big ideas and and high concepts. And um and you know there are other people who are more grounded and they're more like earth and they're more practical and down to earth and giving you how tos and step by step. And, and that's me. And, you know, <laughs> some people are more water and they're able to connect everyone. And it's almost like they're speaking on everyone's behalf and everyone feels mm. the healing process taking place. And then, and, um, and some people are wood. They're just really good at creating the structures for how to change. And, and so I kind of walk through these different aspects of it. And, and then to the part that you um, and I were talking about earlier was the seven frequencies of communication. Mm -hmm. What, what, ended up happening was as I had the art of communication uh, masterclass out, uh, we were doing these live Q and A's and they were for me more exciting than, than all the content <laughs> I put out on the masterclass. And so we had 10 weeks of, of questions and Q and A with people from all over the world. And, and so I began realizing that um, there was a, there's a component that I needed to bring back in. And I spent several days just mapping this out. And in fact, you, you would think I was at a ayahuasca retreat, you know, because <laughs> my wife saw me at five o'clock in the morning. I was drenched in sweat because I hadn't slept in three days, just writing and writing and writing all, all the content for the seven frequencies. And, and so what I did is I, I broke down human communication uh, into seven core frequencies that people both communicate from and listen from. But every frequency has a shadow. And, and so each one of these frequencies has a shadow frequency that will actually cause you sometimes to reject things that you need to learn because the frequency comes at you and it's shadow. Let me give you an example. One of the frequencies is called the motivator. And the reason I start there is that I think it's the most common frequency on Instagram and <laughs> in social media. Mm -hmm. You know, most of the people we listen to are motivators. They make us feel great. They, they inspire us. They, um, they fill us with oxygen and in, in fact, there's a, a speaker called um, Joel Olstein, mm -hmm. and a lot of and and I'm here in LA, and I do a lot of work in Hollywood, and a lot of my friends are Jewish, and what's really interesting is all of our Jewish friends love Joel Olstein, 
They they don't believe what he believes. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe, you know, even in the Bible, most of them are kind of like um, secular Jewish people, but they love Joel Osteen. In fact, one time my, um, my, uh, my sister uh, said, I listen to Joel Osteen because he's like my happy pill. And, um, and a lot of people think that's terrible, but I think it's actually incredibly inspiring that there's someone whose whole role in life is to inspire people because people can be so depressed and so despondent and, and, and not even have the, the, the psychological energy to get up in the morning and to go to work and to do life. Yeah. And, and then you got someone who's inspiring, they're just breathing life into them. And that's the motivator. And, and, but the shadow of the motivator is the, um, the, the performer. And, and so sometimes you'll listen to a speaker and I don't know if this has happened to you, Amy, but where you're like, it's kind of motivational, but I feel like he's performing. Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and, I know. Mm -hmm. No. And, and you actually mentioned how authenticity is so important to you. So yeah. you probably have a, a pretty strong radar. You can just feel, you know, I like that yeah. you call these things frequencies because they really yeah. are. And you can feel when there's like this dissonance. Yeah. And, and. I, maybe I'll be like a little more transparent on this, but like, because, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a Christian and I'm a follower of Jesus and mm -hmm. I've, you know, I started a church called Mosaic, but I, I grew up irreligious and I grew up outside the faith and I never really felt um, a comfort inside of the culture of Christianity, ironically. And what really bothered me is when I would listen to, I would turn on Christian television and I felt like I was watching performers mm -hmm. and it felt disingenuous and, and I would tell my wife, I said, this isn't good for me because it makes me wonder, you know, well, is this really what I'm a part of? And, and I began to realize, oh, it's not that the message isn't true, is that the frequency is a shadow frequency. It's a, it's a person who's more focused on what the audience feels about them than what they feel about the audience. And when a frequency is externalized, it's, it's focused on serving the listener. You have a, a frequency that's really a, a frequency of light. And when you have the frequency that's turned inward and it's focused on your own self, then that frequency becomes darkness. And so the motivator can become a performer. And, and, I, and I, I've worked with a lot of really gifted communicators who are motivators, and they would go back and forth to being performers. And I can tell you, it was so challenging to help them. And one of the conversations I would have with them, I said, you know, you have unlimited capacity, but your ceiling is your willingness to be authentic. And I can't tell you how transparent or authentic to be. I can just tell you that whatever you choose will become the limit of your communication power and capacity. And I was working with one really gifted communicator um, in his 30s, uh, really bright light -like talent, but he was so performance oriented. And, and, when, and I sat down with him, walked him through. I said, I just want you to try to become authentic just one time, just to like go walk on that platform. Don't worry about what your audience thinks about you. Just focus on their well-being. And he sent me a text and he said, Hey, I just did a talk and I really worked on being authentic and it went really badly. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, authenticity may be too hard. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember when my, my son was young because I don't know if you can imagine like being the son of someone who's kind of known around the world as a communicator and, and he had so much pressure on him and, and he went to New York was a part of other community there and learned communication styles from a different place and he came back to LA and, and I know my son so I knew it wasn't him on stage. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, and every time he got off stage I'd say I just I just want the authentic you I just want the authentic you and. And at that time, I didn't know how to like translate that better for him. And one day he came up to me because he's very clever. He said, dad, what if my authentic self is inauthentic? <laughs> oh, I mean, that's a legit question, right? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And, and I thought, I said, no, it's, it's really about the fear of rejection. Yeah. Right. Which is such it, it, a base a fundamental fear in our human nature, you know, yeah. fearing being left by the herd or, you know, that kind of yeah. thing. So yeah. it's, it, there's a lot to overcome with that. Whether you're sober curious or on your sobriety journey, like I am, you know, there can be challenges along the way. That's why I want to tell you about Everbloom. Everbloom is a new way to get support in alcohol recovery. 
Everbloom knows that, particularly, the first 90 days of sobriety can be extra challenging. So they offer everything from a free plan to one-on-one -on -one coaching along the way, along with meetings, uplifting emails, which I've been getting and loving, and curated resources. Everbloom provides small online meetings with people matched to you, where you will find conversation and connection, and you can also set and achieve weekly goals with your Everbloom group coach, who's dedicated to guiding you through your sobriety journey. Everbloom creates a safe space for peer support, and we all know that makes such a difference. It's even been found to be clinically effective at improving long-term sobriety outcomes. Community matters. So even if you're just sober curious, you can get connected to others and find support along the way. So whatever phase of your sobriety journey you're in, whether you're struggling, you want to get sober, or you're looking for more connection, sign up today for a free meeting. No pressure, no commitment, just check it out and get the support you need. Everbloom, a new way to get support in alcohol recovery. Sign up today at joineverbloom, that's B-L-U-M-E, dot com, or follow the link in the show notes. I'll see you there. Are you ready to up-level your pleasure practice? I have in mind, and the main things that have helped me are the tools that I've found from Wands. Wands creates luxurious products that encourage us all to honor our body, celebrate our sexuality, and live in pleasure with more pleasure all the time. One of my favorites, if you listen to this show, then you probably already know, is the cervix wand. Wands has trademarked their number one best-selling glass pleasure wand. It's for vaginal and anal de-armoring, and it's designed for cervical and G-spot stimulation. And let me tell you, it's incredible. It's helped thousands of women become more connected to their bodies and their pleasure, and supports them to heal pelvic pain through self-yoni massage, and helps awaken more pleasure. Just recently, I've ordered the Venus Wand, another trademarked wand from Wands, and it's designed to activate and awaken the G-spot and more. Also, don't miss one of their new offerings, which are free bleed blankets that can be used as waterproof intimacy blankets. They have a beautiful selection now available. But take a look around at wands.com, that's W-A-A-N-D-S, because they have a huge selection of incredible items like yoni eggs, crystal pleasure wands in amethyst, black obsidian, anything that your heart desires, and so much more. Check them out at wands.com. That's W-A-A-N-D-S dot com. And use my link in the show notes to get 10% off or simply enter my code Amy Edwards at checkout. Again, that's W-A-A-N-D-S wands.com. Do you want me to walk through another frequency? You know what? I kind of would, because when I heard you speak, you only mentioned the shadow frequency of motivators. So, um, uh, and you know, maybe so you want we, more, <laughs> I, I, I want a little bit more. I mean, you know, one of the things though, that I want to point mm -hmm. out in this is that I love that you call them frequencies because mm -hmm. it gives us this fluidity and yeah. ability to tap into the frequency that we can use at that moment. Because after I heard you speak and we, t you, you laid mm -hmm. out all seven and, um, which I'm just going to say the set of seven are motivator, okay. challenger, commander, the healer, the professor, the seer, and the maven. Is that correct? Right. Okay. Yes. yes. And so a lot of people were saying, which one are you? Which one are you? And I didn't feel like I had a real solid one that I was. And so it was just interesting as an afterthought to know how you chose the word frequency and mm -hmm. to come from it from that place, because we don't have to choose just one. I think that the, that it has to have some kind of like fluidity within it. Wouldn't, right. Would you I agree with a, that? Yeah, this is a great point. The seven frequencies is not based on a fixed mindset. It's it's based on yeah. a growth mindset. And, and so when you're looking at most personality assessments, I mean, if it's like the Myers-Briggs or the Strength Finder or the DISC or, um, you know, they'll they'll give you a personality structure and that's who you are. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's who you are for life. And and there's a lot of accuracy to that. Um, but there's also great limitations the way it's presented. The seven frequencies is not fixed. It, the, my understanding of the seven frequencies is that all of us have a core frequency that we begin with. Okay. And as we grow as communicators, we usually create like a triangle of two or three frequencies that we begin to use very comfortably. And, and there's usually um, a, a frequency that um, feels almost inaccessible to us. And, but ideally as a communicator, 
if you can keep adding every frequency to be able to use all seven frequencies when they're needed, that's the ideal. Yeah, for, for example, like my, my, my core frequency is a maven. When I'm not thinking about communicating, I just communicate to someone who violates your view of reality. And I don't mean to, it was, I didn't set it as my goal. I, I use that statement because I realized after all the decades of being alive, uh, people find me dangerous <laughs> in mm. my thinking. Even when I think I'm just telling the truth or just saying what's obvious to everyone, I realize, oh, it is not, it is not obvious to everyone. And not only is it not obvious to everyone, it feels dangerous to everyone. But my my most um, distant frequency is commander. Um, I hate commanding. <laughs> I do not, I, I have like almost not a single authoritarian bone in my body in that way. And in fact, we're, we're just shooting some clips right now. And uh, and my son and uh, one of our team members, Austin, they're always like, you know, directing saying, all right, great. Blow, you know, that was like a, a breathtaking, like out of the water kind of idea. Could you like tell people what to do now? I go, I, I don't really like that. They go, just look, <laughs> you just look at the camera and just tell them what to do. And it is so hard for me. Now, it, when I get there, I'm okay. <laughs> but I, it, it is like jumping off the wrong leg or writing with the wrong hand. And, um, and I only use commander, but I, but I use commander instinctively when a situation is dangerous, when we're in crisis, or when I'm playing sports. <laughs> <laughs> and all so it's of a sudden, there. It's there. I am a, I am a <laughs> commander off the scale, and you would think that was my number one frequency. And so what, what you do as you grow and mature as a human being, you want to be able to access all seven frequencies and be able to use them when you need them. Yeah, that's that's what hit me. And I thought, I, I guess I was wondering too, you know, how do you find yourself during the day? Can you sometimes just be like, oh, I'm tapping into that, you know? Or I guess, you know, the more you study them, the more you're going to become adept at at really tapping in in the moment when it's needed. And how yeah, do you, you read the situation? How do you, or do you just right. feel it? Like, Yeah, and the more you understand it, the more mastery you can have over it. Yeah. If you don't even understand that you have frequencies in a sense they have mastery over you. And, Ooh, and I, yeah. yeah. And, and I use the word frequency because I actually do think that the universe is designed by frequencies. And it's just in the same way that humans perceive color because we can actually see energy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but we don't think, oh, I'm looking at energy and that energy is blue, or I'm looking at energy, that energy is red. We're just saying, I, I see color. And in the same way with human communication, we don't think to ourselves, oh, I'm listening to a frequency or, or I'm communicating from a frequency. But in the same way you're looking at energy with color, you are actually listening to frequencies in human connection. Yeah. And, and I think it's really important for us to come to an understanding of the power we have. When you communicate, I mean, I, where, where's your home, Amy? Austin, Austin, Austin Texas. Mm -hmm. I'm here in, uh, in West Hollywood. And, um, and we're able to communicate because our frequencies are able to travel in this invisible space that radio travels and television travels and sonar travels because we are species that can actually transmit frequencies that, that translate meaning into another person's life. And not just meaning, we can translate emotion. You can yeah. listen to a speaker a thousand miles away and suddenly you, you tear up and you start swallowing up because that, that frequency is literally translated emotion into your soul. I mean, that's almost like magical power. It, it, it is. It's a trip. It's yeah. such a trip to think about. And um, it kind of like boggles my human brain, you know, but, but I know it's there and I know yeah. what we're, that we're capable of it. And our voices, I always say our voices are just our mo most powerful tool. Like, mm -hmm. but to think of it in a more frequency related way just gives it that extra layer of power, I think. Yeah. And it, um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, most uh, professional communicators like yourself, I find usually operate off of almost like two frequencies simultaneously. And um, are, are you familiar with uh, Ed Milet? Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, Ed, Ed's a friend of mine and um, love him very, very much. And my assessment of Ed, and this is unsolicited, is that the reason he connects to people so well, he uses two frequencies at the same time. And they're almost conflicting frequencies. He's a healer and commander at the same time. 
And so when he's communicating, he's communicating a frequency that actually brings healing to people who've been hurting, discouraged, mm. um, you know, felt overwhelmed by life. And so he, he has this unexpected healing frequency. At the same time, he has this commander frequency with authority and command, and he's telling you what to do. And it's, it's almost like he says, I'm, I'm in charge. I know what to do. I'm telling you what to do. You need to follow me. And I'm healing you at the same time. And you're going to be okay. That's powerful. <laughs> and it's really pretty dynamic. Mm -hmm. And so I, I've been studying different people and, um, and, and just looking at where is this dynamic tension with people. And, and, you know, so you may be one of those people that when you're communicating, you become, you know, healer professor or healer challenger or healer commander or whatever it may be in that mix. And, um, and are you familiar with, um, I'll do one, Lewis Howes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lewis and I, I, I've just had his birthday party this past week and ah. um, just a beautiful human being, but his, his, his um, podcast is what the uh, school of greatness mm -hmm. and his conference is the summit of greatness. So you would think it's all about greatness. It would be like challenger, right? Or commander. Lewis's total frequency is healer. And his, his whole frequency, every episode is about healing. And uh, he'll, he's always going to bring the conversation back to how can people heal? How can they deal with their wounds? How can they deal with their brokenness? How can they deal with their inner child? And so when I spoke at his conference this past year, I was walking around getting to know people and I realized, because I, I knew nothing about the conference and I'm thinking greatness, right? Mm -hmm. I, need, I need to like bring challenger to this room. Like I need to bring my maven mode. I need to just like elevate the room in a whole different way. But what I was reading the room is, I think this is a room of people who, it's almost like a therapeutic room. Mm. Like people are here because they're, they, they need healing and this is a safe space and, and there's a lot of brokenness and, um, and maybe a lot of like uh, a, a longing to trust, but, but it has been betrayed. And I just started feeling this in the room. And so I'm on the stage and I tell myself, make sure you bring your healing frequency in at least three quarters of the way through the message. And then I thought it's not going to happen. I'm going to get so focused on what my core frequencies are. I'm going to forget. So I opened up my talk going with a, with a healer frequency nice. and I did it consciously and significantly. And, and it was like a transformative moment. And afterwards at my book signing that lasted like hours, people just come kept coming, weeping. I mean, crying person after person going, I don't understand it. But the moment you started speaking, I felt like I was being healed. The, the moment you started speaking, I felt like my wounds are being addressed and, and, and they didn't even realize that I consciously, uh, it's like I called out this healer frequency. And that's the thing is that you can't imitate it. You, you, it has to be created from within. It has to be a true expression of who you are as a person. And then when you step into that, and, and usually for me, the way I do that is, I mean, I, I'm an immigrant from El Salvador. I never knew my real father. My grandparents raised me for the first section of my life. My mom came in, uh, um, mm -hmm. took us home later. And then she was a total stranger to me. And so our relationship was always tumultuous. And then she married a guy in, in basically um, creative underground economies. And um, so we had an alias. So I lived with an alias all my life. My name, Erwin McManus, is an alias. Wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So by the time I was 12 years old, I was in a psychiatric chair and just in, in and out of hospital. And I was uh, a psychological disaster. Uh, I was really broken. And wow. And so when I, um, so my, my, I don't think my, like, if I have a genetic frequency, it wasn't supposed to be healer, but I have an experiential frequency that's deeply and profoundly healer. And all yeah. I have to do is, is go there honestly and authentically and remember the level of pain I was in and how I never thought I could recover and the brokenness that, that was more like a shattering. And then to remember the, the, what my soul needed to hear. Wow. Uh, and and then you yeah. can tap into that frequency and it's authentic and it's real. And and I think the 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 textures and the complexity of of your journey is what increases your frequency, not skill, yeah. not technique, and <laughs> uh and and not my master class. Like uh. the, the the master class will guide you to the place where you have to decide to become the person where that frequency comes to life. There's something so interesting in there of what, everything that you just said, and what a powerful story. Um, thank you for sharing it. But there's something so interesting to me about the paradoxes and 
to become a great communicator, to get in touch with what you really need to say in that moment requires this slowing down and this flow with the frequency that is needed in that moment, you know, yeah. not, um, also being broken necessarily, but tapping into your authenticity about where, how you have healed and being able to read that room. And as a, as, since we're talking about communication, for me, one of the things that like when people say, oh, wow, you know, you, I, I like your, you know, how your style is and your communication mm -hmm. and your podcast and all that. And I'm like, there's really, it's so simple. You just listen, <laughs> you become a good listener. And it's this, this little paradox and there's just paradoxes in so many things like if you want love love yourself you know just all the ways that 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 is presented always fascinate me and i think this is just another one where in that moment rather than you trying to figure out what was needed you just opened yourself up in that moment and then stayed the course essentially you know like no, when absolutely. You're talking to that room. Mm -hmm. yeah no i um i, I agree uh, a thousand a thousand percent you know and um, one of the, I think the great challenges, even with communication, is that people see communication as a as a technique, and rather than an opportunity for deep human connection. Mm -hmm. And and if you know, even when I would speak, when I first started speaking in large stadiums, it, you know, the, there were like maybe ten, twenty thousand people, and at first it was overwhelming. You walk in a room. I mean, the first I went from speaking to fifty people to twenty thousand people in one like one day and, wow. yeah, so like i didn't have any like prep time i did i didn't go through stages I, I literally with 45 minutes notice was asked to speak to twenty thousand people in uh the stadium where the dallas uh, mavericks played basketball and i was 29 years old i went to a room i fell on my face and i started crying from absolute you know um fear terror, <laughs> terror yeah. 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 and um and and what I learned very quickly was people would come up to me and say, I felt like you were just talking to me. Mm -hmm. And I realized, okay, the number of the room, number in the room doesn't matter. If I just talk to one person, it will change everything for everyone. And, and, and I found the same thing with writing books when, when I would ask people who want to write books, because they would ask me for advice. And I'd say, well, who, who are you writing to? And they said, everyone. And I said, well, then your books for no one. <laughs> and to say when your books for everyone is for no one like i sit down and i write a book to someone i love i write that book to someone i really care about i write the book to someone who's trying to solve this problem and if i can just get them to sit down long enough i can help them through uh to break the breakthrough to the other side and i find when you write books in a very personal way and um it changes everything and when you said that about listening you kind of stole my thunder <laughs> I, I was just no, listening no. so good all your words <laughs> no because you're right and that's why you're good at what you do i tell people look that look great communicators uh i hate to say this they don't have to listen the genius communicators have to listen mm. like because some people just have a lot of natural talent that's true yeah it, they really you know, do and, mm -hmm. and, the, and the rules don't seem to apply to them as much and all the time. <laughs> but I always tell people, if you want to be a great communicator, become a great listener. But from what you were saying, I want to just like add the layer. You have to learn how to listen to yourself. Yeah. You know, and. Yeah. Um, I, I was wondering about that, too, with you talking about purpose. I know that that's a big part of the communication styles and really what you want to say. And I think some people feel lost in their purpose and maybe aren't as connected with that. What do you tell them about getting in touch with their purpose and, and listening to themselves? It's funny at that conference that we were at together, by the way, Jimmy Rex is an amazing guy. We are and the day. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Big shout out. Um, you know, it's supposed to be a business conference, but it felt like a spiritual retreat. <laughs> Big time. I mean, I would have, I, I would never have said it was a business conference. <laughs> I know. I thought, wait a minute, where, where, where am I? <laughs> and, yeah. uh, so someone asked me, how do you not lose your purpose when you've lost your business or you lost your company or, or you've lost everything? And that was in the Q and A. And I said, here's, here's the thing. If your purpose is attached to your success, it's fragile. If your purpose is attached to your wealth, it's fragile. If your purpose is attached to anything external, it's fragile. So your purpose needs to be attached to your personhood. So if your purpose is about the person you're becoming, it's untouchable by outside forces. 
Y'all, I have started using higher dose products and I am such a fan. You know, I don't put anything on this podcast that I am not 100% completely behind. And I have a special discount code for you for all higher dose products. I'm so excited. If you don't know, Higher Dose is a wellness company. They have wellness tech products, they have tools, they have supplements, and they have body care. They have so many things that are hot right now, too, that are really biohacking and up-leveling our lives at home, which is really cool. They have an infrared sauna blanket. They have an infrared PEMF mat that I'm so excited to be sharing about soon. One of my favorites, though, is the red light face mask. It stimulates collagen, it activates glowing skin, reduces fine lines, regenerates cells, and it's soft. It's not like one of the hard plastic ones, so you can kind of move it around on your body, which I've been doing, and I am seeing amazing results. I am absolutely addicted to it. I use it every single night, and I'm using it in conjunction with one of their other products, the Glow Serum, and I'm very picky about what I put on my skin, and I am loving the Glow Serum. It's specially formulated to plump and hydrate and stimulate radiant skin, which that's the goal. They have a ton of other products too, magnesium ingestibles, magnesium body care, which has a healing oil and a serotonin soak that you can use in your bath, which I've been using too. It boosts your mood, enhances your skin and deepens your detox, gets you calmed down. Anyway, I'm a fan. So I'm so excited to offer you 15% off using my code MAGIC15. Go to the show notes. You can click through on the link right there. Or if you go to Higher Dose, just enter the code MAGIC15 and you'll get 15% off. Higher Dose has been featured in Goop, Glamour, Elle, Vogue, Bazaar, Allure, basically you name it. And there's a reason why. So go check it out. It's at higherdose.com and enter my code MAGIC15 for 15% off. And so I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a pastor and I'm a writer and I'm a filmmaker and I'm a fashion designer and, and I'm a high-end mastermind one-on-one coach for CEOs and, and, uh, and people who are really successful. And none of those things are my purpose. And a lot of times people say, well, why do you do so many things? You know, don't you just have one thing that's your purpose? And my purpose is who I'm becoming. All those are just ex- applications and canvases for my, for my purpose. And so, you know, I, I lost up to $10 million in a day, six to 10 probably, and uh, of assets. And um, I didn't lose my purpose. I just lost my money. I lost my company. I didn't lose my purpose because I was still uh, me and I was still becoming the person I wanted to become. And I thought, okay, I guess for me to become the person I need to become, I've got to go through this. And so losing everything doesn't go against my purpose because I want to be the best human being I can possibly be. That's the way you don't lose your purpose. That's where you find it. Decide who you want to become. Make that your purpose. Yes. Yes. That speaks to me in every way because I've done the same thing. I've put, I've put success as something defined by an exterior marker. And I realized pretty quickly that that was a recipe for unhappiness, you know, and, and, and it was outside my control. And Whenever you talk about the person that you want to become, I guess people have to define that, right? Who do you really yeah. want to become? You know? Yeah, no, that's true. It's funny. Yeah, I think I could tell this. My son's 34, uh, named Aaron. <laughs> you, you've met Aaron. I met Aaron. <laughs> and, uh, I just saw him a minute ago with your so team. Yesterday, he opens up um, a business account and has his biggest financial day of his life, probably. Oh, congratulations, Aaron. Right? That's great. And I, he wanted me to go there to celebrate with him. And as he opened up his company, and he was miserable. He was having the worst day of his life because he was having a fight with his girlfriend. <laughs> oh, wow. And I could watch his jaw just clenching the whole time. He was fidgeting under the table and he would say, Dad, you might as well just go ahead and leave. <laughs> <laughs> and then later that day, we have the conversation. Um, no amount of success can make you happy. Yeah. It's, I mean, you hear it all the time. Aaron and just slipped into the room right now. <laughs> We're talking about you, Aaron. I, I'm shouting out Aaron McManus, a, a creative machine. He is incredible. And, but, uh, you know, I've been saying this to him all of his life, but I think having that extreme of a day where it was his best business day, best financial day, and it was just a brutal relational day, um, all his fault. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and realizing that, the finances have zero effect on his happiness. And I, and I told him, I said, look, 
not only can success not make you happy, it can't make you unhappy. And so don't be afraid of success. You know, some people say, no, it's success that makes you unhappy. And that's why you just should underachieve. No, no, success, success can't make you happy, but it can't make you unhappy. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you're living your life for the purpose that you're created to become the best reflection of who you are. And by the way, and I told him, I said, this is why you will measure your life on relationships. If your relationships are healthy, you'll remember that season of your life as one of the best seasons of your life, no matter how successful or unsuccessful you are. And if your relationships are, are toxic and broken, you'll remember that as one of the darkest seasons of your life, no matter how successful you are. And, you know, and it was just a great learning lesson that um, you can put money in the bank, but you can't put happiness in the bank. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. And, yeah. you know, I've noticed that in my own life, just actually right now. And I'm like, wow, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm like, financially, it's, you know, a work in progress right now. But I, and, you know, I'm not the youngest I've ever been or the thinnest or whatever you want to say. But um, I'm just the happiest I've ever been. And, and it was an inside job. But at the same time, that has spilled over into my relationships where they feel more full. And, happier. And I'm, you know, it's that person I'm becoming, I'm focused on that more than anything else. And, um, and another part of that for me right now has been dropping judgments about that. I think that the person that I want to become is one that really isn't judging. And mm -hmm. so I've just been really tuned into that. And I think that is interesting too, with just what you were talking about, like, judging that this should be the greatest day. This should be, you know, and we make all these little yeah. judgments like this is going to bring us happiness. And you know, just being able to drop all of that and understand that we don't, we don't even have to make a judgment about it. Right. Yeah. Is that, would you, would you say that's a conscious part of you determining the person that you want to become? Well, I think one thing is that when you focus on becoming the best version of yourself, you actually become the least judgmental person in the world. <laughs> Great point. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, yeah. I, I am so busy uh, trying to make myself better. I don't have time to criticize other people for not being better. Right, it, right. It gives you an incredible amount of grace uh, for other people, and it makes you so much happier. Unhappy people criticize other people. Mm -hmm. and, and really, people who love life don't criticize other people because, one, if – if someone's doing well, they, people who are enjoying life celebrate other people's success. It doesn't diminish them at all. Yeah. But also people who are really fully alive, um, they don't feel condemnation toward people who are not. They just feel sadness for them mm -hmm. because they want them to live this level of aliveness. And, and it, kind of the awesome thing is like, if you think in terms of like fixed, you know, commodities or unlimited resources, um, what is unlimited is every human being can become a full, beautiful expression of who they're supposed to be. I mean, I believe every human being is created in the image of God. And I, and I mm -hmm. think a huge part of why like Jesus came was to help us um, become human again. Yeah. And, and so no matter what you do in your life, it can't diminish what God wants to do in my life. And so I can celebrate that. And in fact, the moment you start living the life you're created to live, it gives me hope that I can live the life I'm created to live. So I find other people so aspirational. And I'm like, oh, wow, look what they accomplished. That's incredible. And, and then sometimes I get that giddy up kind of thing going, I need to up my game. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I need to have more courage. I need to have more faith. I need to have more fun. I need to be more curious. And, and so I do think that when you begin focusing on becoming the best version of yourself, it just falls off of you. Condemnation, judgment, bitterness, criticism. You know, I, 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 um, I, I go to this little gym down the street. I, I, I know there's no evidence, but I really do. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so they do this DEXA scan where they tell you how much body fat you have and how much, you know, muscle mass you have and everything. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, and, you know, I, like in the last few months, I gained like 17 pounds of muscle, but I didn't lose any, any fat. And I thought, okay, well, at least I'm like disguising the fat. And, <laughs> uh, and this guy, you know, said to me, look, if you just walk 10,000 steps for 30 days, it would literally just melt off of you. And that's not that hard. Mm -hmm. And I thought, 
oh, I should do that. And so <laughs> I, here I am now, like I won't even let myself go to sleep unless I get like those 10,000 steps and just, I just believing because there's some things that you have to add on like muscle. There's some things you have to add on like courage, like faith, like integrity. But some things you have to like walk out. This needs to flush out of your system. And that's bitterness and jealousy and slander and gossip. That stuff you just got to wash out of your system. And, and the moment you're focused on becoming the best version of yourself, that stuff starts flushing out. Uh, what a great analogy. That's, I love that. It's like you just made that up on the fly. It's so I did good. just make it up. I've never shared you it like did. that. I just it made really, it up. It was really <laughs> good. <laughs> I loved it. Um, yeah, you know what? I, I think that that's so incredible. Uh, what a great way to put it. And I'm going to use that. I'm going to, I'm going to remember that, that these things are just flushing out and it, it it is flushing out like they're still going to come up sometimes and that's okay because we're human you know yeah. and like the more grace that we can have around that the more grace we can have with ourselves and others uh yeah I'm they're curious. toxins they're, they're, they're toxins, toxins. and, and no matter special. how many times you get rid of toxins you still have to keep getting rid of toxins <laughs> Forever. That's right. That's right. You do. Um, how, like, where do you find all this in your own internal dialogue? How's that for you? And do you, do you coach other people on that in your courses? Well, I do a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching and that's <laughs> where I really help people um, break through the, the self-limiting structures inside of their minds. And in fact, by the way, that's why, ah, oh, I'm such a terrible salesman, but I um I have a book coming out September 19th called Mind Mind Shift. Ooh, and, and, great yeah, name! Yeah. It, oh, thank you. And Mind Shift is uh, about 12 internal mental structures that either will limit or unleash our success, and but they're really about sustained successability. You can become really successful fast with very very bad patterns in your life, and but then you die alone. And um, you may still die rich, but you die alone. You die unhappy, you die disconnected. And uh, I want people to be able to have sustained success where they can live their life with incredible well-being. And so I just, I wrote this book on these 12 internal structures. And because I, I find that 90, 99% of our limitations are all uh, within our mental structures or within our mindset, within our, our, um, our, our, our thinking patterns. And and I, I know for myself, when I was young, I was just so depressed and um, I really struggled with um, almost debilitating depression. And I, I don't know why, but around the age of 12 or 13, I told myself, one, I told myself, I'm going to change. And I made a, uh, a fortunate physical change. I moved from Miami to North Carolina. So I told myself, nobody knows me. So I can decide to be a new person. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I'm only... 13 years old or four, not at that point, 15, but I, I was able to go, I'm going to become a different person. And so I used the geography as a way of, um, of making a shift. But then I also made like personal changes. Like I built a gym, like in my backyard, just started working out every day and started boxing every day and, and, and started doing things to build my own personal success and build things that build my confidence and, and, and to build uh, internal structures of disciplines that could help me become the person I wanted to become because a dream without a discipline is just a mirage. And, you know, and so I began developing disciplines to be able to actualize those dreams. And I can tell you really quickly, I began to change very fast and, and my internal world began to change. One of the things I did was this, I told myself, look for beautiful things all around you. And, and so I became like a connoisseur of beauty. I started seeing flowers and trees and, and grass blades and, you know, bees and, and sunsets and sunrise. And, and I became an aesthetic. And what I didn't realize is that I was waking, uh, I, was, I, I was awakening the artistic part of my soul and giving myself permission and uh, uh, to see beauty as essential in my life. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it changed my life because for art to exist, there only has to be truth. But uh, for beauty to exist, there has to be hope. Wow. And whenever I began looking at beautiful things, it began to create hope inside of me. And, and, and what ended up happening was, you know, uh, two decades later, I, I wrote down that I wanted to be a voice of hope. And because I realized that one of the things the world so desperately needs is, is just even the smallest container of hope. 
And when, a, you know, because once a person has a little bit of hope, they're dangerous because mm -hmm. they believe they can change. They believe the world can change. And I remember I was meeting with this top tier leader, um, the most successful guy in his field at this time. And, and he was, um, we're working through some real limitations in his life. And he looked at me and he goes, do you think I can change? And I said, I know you can change. He goes, I think so too. And, uh, and he goes, how? <laughs> and, uh, and I said, you've just begun to change. The moment you know that you need to change, you've, you're 80% there. The moment you know what needs to change, you're 90% there. <laughs> and the moment you start doing what that change needs to be done, you're kind of 100% there. Well, that's a pretty and, small percentage for action, you know? Yeah. That's, no, that's encouraging it's, it's in itself. <laughs> it is because most people create an illusion of themselves. And you lie to yourself so that you don't have to bring the change necessary. I think the work is easier than the awareness. I know that sounds crazy. No, you know, it's, I don't I don't know. I, I mean, because a lot of people are not willing to get to that awareness. Yeah. I you mean, know? I'm 64 years old and like, you know, I, I and I'm still developing new disciplines in my life. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm still, you know, now I'm like downloading all these audiobooks. I'm in the gym a couple hours a day. I love I that. In there, That's part know? of my message too. It's at any age, you know, I just yeah. turned 50 and I'm like, uh, you know, like at any age we can do it. Go for That's it. That's right. I told my wife yeah. at 65, I'm going to be at the best shape of my life. <laughs> yeah. Like, right on. <laughs> I'm insatiably curious. I I'm still growing and learning. I'm still an apprentice. Uh, I'm a novice. And, and I just know that, um, every limitation that I should have had, I was able to change and overcome through my mental structures. I mean, I've torn everything, knee surgeries, torn hamstrings, broke my neck, cracked Shit. my skull open, broke wow. my elbow. You can't, I broke my jaw playing basketball at 61. Wow. And, uh, and I mean, torn both rotator cuffs. Um, I should not be moving. And when I had <laughs> knee surgery, I went to the surgeon at, um, after I tore my Achilles tendon and I asked wow. him, I said, um, how long will recovery time take for recovering from my knee surgery? I did, I turned down multiple doctors who told me, we'll do the surgery and you'll be able to walk again. I found a surgeon who did pro athletes. And I said, I need a surgeon who believes I can play basketball again. And, uh, and, he, and I said, how long will recovery take? And he says, well, some people, they never recover from the surgery. Some people takes two years, some a year. And I said, how about Kobe? And he said, three months. I said, how long do you think it'll take me? And he said, three months. Okay. And I, and I said, how can you know? He goes, we can predict a person's healing based on their mental structures. You're asking the right questions. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. showing, showing that you were in them headspace. That's yeah. so wild. That's so wild, but so true. Yeah. You know? I just think we just accept such limitations. I had six and a half hour surgery for cancer. And, um, they told me I was gonna have a catheter in for a month, a month after that surgery. I was on a court playing basketball. Hey, wow. And, and I just determined in my mind that um, one, the rules apply to everyone else. The limitations apply to everyone who accepts them. Mm -hmm. And, and if you, um, if you don't lose the battle in your mind, you can win any battle that you're facing. And I know this isn't about the art of communication and the seven frequencies, but this is about life. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's, yeah. that's like, I'm a huge believer in that too. I'm determined. I'm just determined to live my best life at any age. I don't mm -hmm. care. Like, why not? Yeah. Why not? So anyway, mindset. Okay, so anyway. Number 19. <laughs> mindset. Yeah, I'm excited about that. And I would love to have you back on to talk more about mindset when that time arrives, because I've be really great. enjoyed, I really just enjoy, you know, the motivator uh, that you brought to the table today, because I think that's what you brought me because I feel very inspired and, <laughs> um, and motivated and, and, you know, encouraged, I guess, is a good word too, because I am actually going to speak for a We Are The They Women's Conference coming up. It's This will come out after that. But Amazing. Yeah. And, um, and so just hearing these things reinforces like, you know, the focus that we can have in that communication space and how to stay in the right mindset to bring your best, to focus on the purpose and to focus on the other person. And mm -hmm. that is you know, the foundation of really solid communication. So yeah, 
anyway, thank you. I feel really I'm good at, you know, listening to all this and really motivated. So thank you so much for all that you've brought to this. And as we wrap up, I'm keeping an eye on time for you. And I wanted to just open the floor to you and say, is there anything that we missed that you really wanted to mention today? Or is there anything that comes up in your heart right now that, you know, as you read this frequency that you think needs to be said? Um, I just wanted to turn it over to you as we close. Mm -hmm. Well, Amy, it, I've, I've loved our conversation together. Thank you. And I wish, I wish I could say I felt like we missed something. You're a really good interviewer. I think we covered so <laughs> much you. of what I would want to talk about. I, I just think good. that um, uh, maybe if I could just leave a last thought is that most of the time when we finally want to change, and I think people are sincere and they're sincere when they fail, is that you think you have to change everything. And the reason I think we, we so oftentimes are desperate to change and then we find ourselves failing again is that we go from changing nothing to trying to change everything and, and i would just say don't change everything just change something like just just mm -hmm. pick a small win in your life right now uh just love your wife just a little bit more you know love your husband a little more just be kinder more patient with your kids just you know take a five minute walk and and express gratitude to god or um, you know, and just look at the beauty all around you. And like, I, I, I usually in my life, I, when I want to make a big giant change, I just tell myself, just start and just do the smallest amount and, and don't get frustrated yourself because you don't have the resilience yet to do as much as you want. Um, don't be so hard on yourself, but I, I but I also think this, you have more power when you're, when you love life. And, and so when people ask me, well, what's your advice for marriage? I go laugh. Mm -hmm. That's my advice. It's like, that's good advice. Like, you know, you just can't hate a person you laugh with. It's hard to fall out of love with someone that you laugh with. And, and so sometimes for me, it's the simple things. It's like, you know, have fun. Um, mm -hmm. Give yourself permission uh, to celebrate and enjoy life. And don't always be so hard on yourself and don't, you know, always see the problems in the world. The problems are going to be there tomorrow. And just take a few minutes to, um, to enjoy and appreciate the life you have now. So true. That is a beautiful way to end this amazing conversation. Thank you so much, Erwin. And everyone can go find your courses too at theartofcommunication.org or they can go to Erwin McManus on Instagram. Is that correct? I believe that's uh, actually my team has just consolidated everything under is it Irwin McManus dot dot com. So com. Putting, okay, great. Every, yeah, but they're putting everything under Irwin McManus dot com. And I'd love great. for everybody to join me there. I would love that too. And you have some nice free resources there as well. If anybody wants to just dip their toe in a little bit more and I will put all that in the show notes. So thank you so much for being here today. I'm just, uh, you, I'm honored that we got to have this conversation. Thank you to everyone that tuned in today. Thank you for being here. Sign up for the newsletter. It's at amyedwards.com. Everything is available too, including my courses, the youthfulness hack and ageless mindset. You can go to amyedwards.info. It's all there for you. So leave a rating, review, all those things, and definitely follow Erwin for a lot more. And thank you again to our guest, Erwin McManus. And I love you all so much. Keep going, keep being your best selves. Till next time. This has been the Amy Edwards Show from Overcome Studios. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe. And thank you so much for being here. Sign up for our newsletter at amyedwards.com.